Okay, so <coughs> we're going to continue considering quadratic equations. Okay, so then to remind us of where we left, left, left off last time, let's solve <coughs> a particular quadratic equation by completing the square, which is what we did last time. So for example, for example, how about mm, the following equation? x squared plus 6x minus 5 is equal to 3. Okay, so then, <coughs> this is a quadratic equation. Why is it called a quadratic equation, incidentally? Hmm, why is it called a quadratic equation? It's a good question. Why is it called a quadratic equation? Okay, so then this part right here, the left-hand side, first, oops, it's a polynomial. What's its degree? It's degree two. Oops. It's degree two. Okay. So degree two polynomials are called quadratics. They're called quadratics. In all of my math career, I've never been able to figure out the precise reason why they are called quadratics, but I assume, I assume they're called quadratics because here is a very specific quadrilateral, a square, and if this has side length x and side length x, then what's its area? x squared, right? So this x squared term, I assume, is the is the origin of the word quadratic. Okay, so then, if a degree two polynomial is called a quadratic, then why is this thing I gave you called a quadratic equation? Because there's a quadratic in an equation. <laughs> nothing, too, nothing too complicated. Okay, so then how do you go about solving this? By completing the square. Yeah, complete the square. Okay, so we'll add 5 to both sides and obtain x squared plus 6x is equal to 8. So I move the 5 to the other side. Okay, great. So then now, I'll remind you for those of you that are waking up or whatever. So then now you need to add 0. zero, but, right, the trick, the trick is to add the right zero, the right representation of zero. So then, what is the zero we're going to add? <coughs> okay, <laughs> so you mean plus nine and minus nine. How did you arrive at plus nine and minus nine? Right, so then plus, plus, 6 over 2 squared minus 6 over 2 squared is equal to 8. Okay, so then where did the 6 come from? Where did this 6 in the 6 over 2 come from? From this 6, right? It's this 6. Half of this squared, <coughs> add that and subtract it. Okay, so if you do that, <coughs> if you do that, the mouse go? There it is. If you do that, then you get x squared plus 6x plus 9 minus 9 is equal to 8. Now, what's very convenient is that these first three terms, x squared plus 6x plus 9, now they can be written as a perfect square, meaning they can be written as something all squared. What? x plus 3 squared, right? These terms right here. So I'll box. These terms are the same. Okay, and then minus 9 is equal to 8. Okay, so now I'll add 9 to both sides so that we obtain x plus 3 squared is equal to 17. x 
plus three squared is equal to 17. All right, now how do we proceed? The square root of both sides, good. So the square root of x plus three squared is equal to the square root of 17. Okay, so now I want to remove the radical, right, the square root. What is the cost of removing the radical? Replacing it with what? Absolute value, right? The square root of blah squared is the absolute value of blah. So then it is the absolute value of x plus 3 is equal to the square root of 17. <coughs> so there are two possibilities. The, the first possibility, so we want to remove the absolute value, which results in two possibilities. The first is that x plus 3 is equal to negative square root 17. That's possible. Okay, it is also possible that x plus 3 is equal to positive square root 17. Okay, and from here, you just solve for x in the usual way. So x is, is 3 minus the square root of 17. That's possible. Or x is 3, uh, let's see, what is it? Negative 3. Uh, negative 3 plus the square root of 17. <coughs> so two possibilities. And I don't personally mind if you write these two possibilities <coughs> like so. So x is negative 3 plus or minus the square root of 17. Okay, so that symbol right there is red plus or minus. Red or minus. But I, I don't typically use that symbol because I find that it causes confusion among students, right? This, this is, you know, appears, right, according to appearances, this appears to be one equation, but it actually is two different equations. Okay, it means two different equations. So any question about this? <coughs> any question about this particular problem? So you don't need to answer me, but, but I'll ask you, would you be able to do this on a quiz next week? Or I mean, not next week, I mean two days from now. The, co the coming quiz. Good. Okay, so think about that. If the answer is no, then you need to continue uh, to consider that. So then more generally, <coughs> more generally, we have something called the quadratic formula. <coughs> and so what this is, this is something that you can just memorize. I, I don't recommend you do it this way, but it would be possible for you to simply memorize this, and then you never have to complete the square or factor or do anything like that ever again. Right? Just the formula, and it's very mechanical, and just, <coughs> just plug it in and everything works. So <coughs> let's do that. So then the most general quadratic equation can be written like this ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. So every quadratic equation can be written like that, because maybe there's a quadratic on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, so a polynomial of degree 2 on both sides. So you just move all the terms to one side, make one of the sides 0, and then you have these numbers a, b, and c. You know, so a, b, and c could be 5, negative 4, and 7 just three different numbers. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to solve this equation in terms of a, b, and c. So that's what we want. Want to solve the equation in terms of the letters a, b, and c. Okay, so how do you suppose we'll do this? suppose we'll do this? Believe it or not, exactly the same way that we, the exact same technique that we used in the last problem. What technique was used in the last problem? Completing the square. So let's just do that. Let's complete the square. Okay. <coughs> so ax squared plus bx plus c is zero. So what's the, the first thing that we do? <coughs> in all the problems, what's the first thing we do? Am I on recording? Yeah, it's recording. Okay, 
So then <coughs> the first thing we do is we get the constant term to the other side. We don't want that term. Okay, it's, it's in the way. <coughs> yeah, so I'm going to move the C to the other side. Okay, so then AX squared plus BX is equal to negative C. Okay, now what's the next thing that we do? Okay, yeah, that, that, that comes soon, comes soon, but we have to do something else first. Okay. So when we complete the square, when we complete the square, it always, the, the quadratic always has to have leading coefficient what? One, right? What's the leading coefficient? A, right? The coefficient is A. Right, on the x squared term, it's a. We need it to be 1. We need it to be 1. So what shall we do? Let's divide by a. Okay, we'll divide by a. <coughs> so then we'll have ax squared over a plus bx over a is equal to negative c over a. Okay, <coughs> of course, this assumes... What, what am I assuming is true here? That A is what? Or particularly not what? Not zero, right? But that's a legitimate assumption to make because if A was zero, if A was zero, then this wouldn't be a quadratic equation. <coughs> okay. So then simplify this. X squared plus B over A x is equal to negative c over a. Okay, so now, now is where we add 0. Okay, now is where we add 0, so x squared <coughs> plus b over a x. So what we need to do is we need to add half of this and square it, and then, put and then uh, subtract the same thing. So, specifically, it will be plus b over 2a squared minus <coughs> b over 2a squared is negative c over a. <coughs> okay, now, the first three terms on the left-hand side first three terms on the left-hand side can now be written as a perfect square. That can be written as something all squared. What is that something? Yes, x plus b over 2a squared. So these, these terms are the same. So maybe you don't believe. <laughs> maybe you don't believe that they're the same because there's too many letters and when there's too many letters, you know, it makes me upset. So then how could you, how could you verify that actually these, these things that I've boxed are the same? You could, you could multiply it out, right? You could foil it out, and you could determine that they're exactly the same. So if you don't believe me, then please take the time to do that. Okay, so then now, <coughs> minus, minus b over 2a squared is equal to negative c over a. <coughs> Everybody's still with me. Okay, so then <coughs> now I'm going to move the negative b over 2a squared to the right-hand side so that we obtain the following. x plus b over 2a squared is equal to b over 2a squared minus c over a. <coughs> okay. So now we need to start solving for x, right? We want to solve for x. So how do you solve for x? Right, square root. Square root of both sides. <coughs> okay. So we compute the square root of both sides. <coughs> but before I do that, actually, I'm going to make a, a little bit of... I'm going to make things algebraically a little bit nicer. Okay, so I'm going to find a common denominator on the on the right-hand side. So 
So the right-hand side can be written as what? B squared over 4A squared minus C over A. Okay, so then I want to find a common denominator. How can I do that? So what is the common what is what is the denominator of the first term? 4a squared. And what is the denominator of the second term? Just an a. So what's missing for the denominator on the right? 4a, right? So I'm going to multiply the numerator by 4a and multiply the denominator by 4a. So multiply them both by 4a to obtain a common denominator. <coughs> All right, so then x plus b over 2a squared, we're just still just ignoring that for a moment. So now it'll be b squared minus 4ac over 4a squared. Okay, so now we have a common denominator on the right-hand side. Okay, and this is particularly convenient for what, I'm about to what we're about to do. <coughs> Excellent. So then, now we want to compute, we want to solve for x. We want to solve for x. So we need to compute the square root of both sides. So the square root of x plus b over 2a squared is equal to the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 4a squared. Okay, so now let's deal with these things one at a time. So then to remove the radical on the left-hand side, what must it be replaced with? Absolute value, very good. So absolute value of x plus b over 2a is equal to now, now I'm going to use one of the properties of exponents and therefore a property of radicals to say that this is the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by the square root of 4a squared. Because you'll remember that one of the properties of radicals is that x over y to the n is what? Yes, x to the n over y to the n. And the radical, right, the square root symbol is actually exponent what? One half, right? The radical is exponent one half, so the radical can be treated just like an exponent. Okay, good. <coughs> Isn't this entertaining? We're almost finished. Okay, <coughs> so the absolute value of x plus b over 2a is equal to the square root of b squared minus 4ac. So now, the square root of 4 is what? 2. But now, what's the square root of a squared? The absolute value of a. The absolute value of a. <coughs> okay. So now, we have absolute value on two sides of the equation. So this is the first time that at least that I've shown you where absolute value is on two sides of the equation. So when you remove the absolute value on the left-hand side, you get two possibilities. And when you remove the absolute value on the right-hand side, you get two possibilities. So for, e for every pos there's two possibilities due to the left-hand side. And for each one of those, there's two more. So then altogether, how many possibilities are there? four possibilities, so let's write them all down. Or you can watch me write them down, because there's actually not four distinct possibilities. So then, <coughs> there may be, if I remove absolute value on the left-hand side, then it'll be b over 2a is equal to negative the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2 absolute value a, <coughs> or x plus b over 2a is equal to the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2 
the absolute value of A. So that's from, those are the two possibilities, removing the absolute value on the left-hand side. Right, so then in a sense, right, it became right, that one or this one. Okay, now each one of these in turn has two possibilities from the removal of the absolute value. Okay, <coughs> so then x plus b over 2a is equal to negative the square root of b squared minus 4ac over <coughs> 2, and then I can replace the absolute value of a with negative a, <coughs> or, so, or it could be x plus b over 2a is equal to negative the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, <coughs> replacing the absolute value of a with a, okay, or <coughs> x plus b over 2a is equal to the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2 negative a, <coughs> or x plus b over 2a is equal to the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Okay, so then there's four possibilities currently, or at least there's four things written down. Okay, but really some of these are, some of these are the same. So what's the same? So there's four possibilities. Which ones are the same? <coughs> So how about how about this one? Well, I have a negative multiplier in front, and then I have this negative a right here. What will happen to those two negatives? They'll cancel. So it's as if they're not there. And now have a look at this one. Ah, they're not there. Right. So then these two, these two are the same. These two are the same. And similarly, the other two are the same. I need a different color, orange. This is looks looks like a John Madden diagram, doesn't it? Anybody watch football? Anyway, there's a guy named John Madden. He's always flying on the screen. <coughs> Funny guy. Okay, so then there's only two possibilities. Okay, there's only two possibilities. Altogether, <coughs> the possibilities become the following. So, x plus b over 2a is equal to plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. Okay, so those are the two possibilities. So now I'm going to solve for x, because that's what we were trying to do, right? <coughs> okay, so then x x is negative b over 2a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So you can see that there is already <coughs> a common denominator. So I can write this as a single, uh, a single fraction as follows. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. So there it is. That's the quadratic formula. I don't know if you ever have seen it demonstrated for you. Right? Isn't it glorious? You know, it took a little bit of took a little bit of work, but we showed all steps. Drew a bunch of colorful arrows, and there it is. <coughs> okay. So this is something that you need to memorize. And because it's so important for you to memorize, I'm going to do this for you. <coughs> and then thank me later. Okay, this formula can be sung to the tune of Frere Jaca. If you've ever heard the Frere Jaca, in English it's Brother John. In 
friendship. Trevor Jaka. This one? Okay, so here we go. <coughs> Negative B plus or minus the square root, the square root of B squared minus 4AC of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A all over 2A and isn't that great? My four-year-old no even when he was three he knew the, the quadratic formula okay so I promise you that you he, he, he had no idea what it meant okay that's fine but he could still sing it okay, so then I promise you that you can memorize I know that you think it's silly, but you know there's going to be an exam next week, and if you listen quietly, you know around the middle of the exam, you'll hear someone. You know, you'll hear it. You'll probably hear it. Okay, because I always hear it. Basically, every time I give this book, I hear someone. Okay, great. So, any question about this uh, formula? <coughs> okay, now here's something interesting. Here's something interesting. The last, the last class. We ended with a particular quadratic. Let's open it up and have a look at it. Open up, thingy. We, we ended the class with a quadratic, and we were completing the square, and I said that, oh, well, I wouldn't have chosen this quadratic. I wouldn't have chosen it for the first example. Because why? What was the deal with that quadratic? Why, why is it not opening? Open up. Okay, well, I don't know what it's doing, so let's open it like this. Mm. Oh, I mo I moved all of them. Okay, so okay, so I can't open it. Does any? Will someone please tell me what the last quadratic was? Three x squared. Minus six x plus five is ze is zero. Okay, so we completed the square. We completed the square, and we arrived at a position, and we said, "Oh, oh, there's no solutions to this quadratic," and that's perfectly legitimate. That's legitimate. Okay, quadratics can have no solutions. There's no problem with that. Okay, but you know, as a teacher, if I had been careful, I I would have not chosen that as the first example. I chosen one that has two different solutions like the one that we did today. Okay, so then now, someone explain to me, someone explain to me how we can detect, how we can detect without completing the square now that we know the quadratic formula, that this thing has no solution. How can you detect? Hmm, let's think about it. Consider this formula, the quadratic equation, the quadratic formula here. Right? What is the big problem? So there's no problem with dividing by 2a because a is assumed to be non-zero because if a was zero, it wouldn't be a quadratic. And you wouldn't be using the quadratic formula in the first place. So there's no problem with that division. But there still can be a problem with computing, with using that formula. What can go wrong? Ah, the square root could have a problem. The square root could have a problem. If you you cannot compute it except in the very specific cases where I say we are dealing with complex numbers. If I don't say that, then we're not dealing with complex numbers. Okay, <coughs> meaning imaginary numbers. So then, if b squared minus 4ac is negative, if b squared minus 4ac is negative, then you can't use the quadratic formula. You can't use it. Okay, you can't plug things in. And the interpretation Right, as far as the quadratic equation is concerned, that means that there's no solution, and that's okay. That's okay. So, what is what are a, b, and c in this particular question? So, a is what? Three, and b is negative six, and c is five. So, let's compute the expression b squared minus four ac. So, <coughs> it will be negative six squared minus 4 times 3 times 5. Okay, 4 times 3 times 5. So negative 6 squared, what's that? 36. And then minus 4 times 3 is 12. 
times 5. Okay, and then 12 times 5 is, right, so then minus, minus 60, okay, so then this is negative 24. Ah, so the thing under the square root in the quadratic formula in this problem would be negative 24. You can't, you can't compute the square root of negative 24 unless we're in the section where we're dealing with imaginary numbers, and we aren't. So then, you know, you can see, ah, the quadratic form formula agrees with, with our observation that that equation has no solution. Okay, so then this thing under the square root is, is so important for that, for that kind of reason that it has a name, it has its own name, okay, and it is referred to as the discriminant. So let's write that down. <coughs> this the discriminant <coughs> because what it what it helps you do is it helps you discern right it helps you decide which case you are in because every quadratic equation right some quadratic equations will have no solution that's okay some quadratic equations will have exactly one solution and that's okay and some quadratic equations will have exactly two solutions and that's okay but the discriminant the discriminant is what, what helps you tell which situation you're in. Zero solution, one solution, or two solutions. Okay. So then, we're going to refer to it as D for discriminant is B squared minus 4AC. Okay, for the quadratic, AX squared plus BX plus C is equal to zero. Okay, so you have this this thing, b squared minus 4ac. So there are only in exactly three cases. If the discriminant is negative, if the discriminant is negative, then, whoa, 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 whoa. Mouse went crazy. <coughs> if the discriminant is negative, then can you plug b squared minus 4ac into that square root? No, you cannot b squared minus 4ac, if b squared minus 4ac is negative, then you can't compute that square root, so how many solutions are there? No solutions. So let's make a copy of the quadratic formula for visual reference. So another possibility, another possibility is that the discriminant could be exactly equal to zero. Right, so if the discriminant is negative, no solution. If the discriminant is exactly equal to zero, if it's exactly equal to zero, then let's plug that into the quadratic formula. Then we would have x is equal to negative v plus or minus the square root of zero over 2a, right? So then what is the square root of zero? Zero, so it would be just equal to negative b over 2a. Okay, so then that's, that's the solution. So how many solutions are there? One solution. <coughs> In fact, I'm gonna write it below. Okay, so then, what is the third possibility for the discriminant? It could be negative, it could be zero, or it could be positive, right? It's a number, it has to have those properties. It can't be anything else, right? So it could be positive. Okay, so then what will happen in that case? Two solutions, right? There's two different ones, right? So. If b squared minus 4ac is positive, then its square root is positive, right? Because the square root of something is always positive. Okay, so if the discriminant is positive, it has a positive square root. And therefore, there are two different solutions, right? Negative b plus the square root of the discriminant over 2a, and negative b 
minus the square root of the determinant over 2a. Okay, so there are two solutions. <coughs> Okay, now the book doesn't decide to do this, I, and I'm going to just be different than the book. Okay, so this thing is referred to as a quadratic. Okay, now we haven't really done any graphing, so I would say, like, if you look at this, <laughs> if you look at these last couple pages, right? This is like math sentences, right? Just math sentence after math sentence after math sentence has no drawing. I kind of don't really agree with the approach the author is taking. Okay, so I'm going to defer a little bit, and I'm going to, for now, just hope that maybe you've been exposed to this before. What is the name for the graph of a quadratic? It starts with P. Parabola. Right? It's a parabola. Okay, so the, gr the name for the shape of the graph of a quadratic is referred to as a parabola. How does it look like with your hand? Like a U, right? Okay. Some parabolas open up, like so. Do all parabolas open up? No, not all parabolas open up. Some of them open down. Okay? So then, so then. This is what is what is actually happening. No, I don't want blue. I want uh, yeah, black would be fine. Okay, and a big big one. There's one possibility, another possibility, another possibility. So if you look at the graph of a quadratic, and we, we, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay, because we're going to get to this. But if you look at the graph of a quadratic, okay, that has no solution, right, it will look like this. Oop, I don't need that. I don't understand why it does this every lecture. It just causes me to wait for a minute. And the mouse is lagging. Okay. <coughs> okay, the quadratic will look like so. <laughs> Up to my ability to draw. Okay, so then how many times, how many times does the parabola cross the black line? Zero times. Zero times. Similarly, how about this quadratic? How many times does this quadratic cross the black line? Two times. And then finally... So how many times does this quadratic touch the black line? Exactly once, right? So then, right, zero, zero crosses, one cross, two crosses. Zero, one, two. Right, so all of these things, you know, they all, they have a linguistic, Right, an algebraic understanding associated to them. They also have a geometric associated association to them. So then, I would say, in my experience, students are about half and half in the geometric and the algebraic. Me personally, I'm I'm geometric, right? I'm writing all these things over here, but that's because I'm, you know, I have training and I'm used to it now. But actually, when I'm thinking about it, I think about it with the picture, not with the actual writing. Okay. <laughs> so, any question about this? Okay. <coughs> good. So let's have an example. Let's have an example. <coughs> Do I like this one? Yeah, so I'm going to read this example aloud. Okay. A 20 foot by 55 foot. Don't worry, I'm going to write down this stuff. I just want you to kind of listen to get the idea. A 20-foot by 55-foot rectangular swimming pool is surrounded by a concrete walkway of uniform width. Okay, so then, you know, you've been to a swimming pool before, like maybe in someone's backyard. This is a rectangular pool, and surrounding the pool is a sidewalk. 
right? So the pool is a rectangle, and there's a sidewalk surrounding the pool, which is also a rectangle. Okay, and the sidewalk has uniform width. Okay, if the area of the concrete walkway is 400 feet, find the width of the walkway. Right, so we don't know. What it is is that we know how big the pool is. The pool is a rectangle, and we know it, the measurements of the pool. And we know that the walkway around it is also a rectangle. But we don't know how wide it is. But we know how much area it has. Okay, we know how much area it has because maybe we poured the concrete in. We know how much concrete we poured. But we, for some reason, didn't measure how wide it is, and, and all of the rulers have been destroyed. So then now... We want to figure out how wide it is. Okay, so then this is the picture. Let's see if it does it. Oh, isn't that cool? <laughs> okay, so then now let's do another one. Okay, so this is the water. <coughs> the water. And according to the... According to the book, it says that it's 20 feet on this side and 55 feet on that side. <coughs> okay, so now let's, let's draw the concrete. Okay, so we'll do it in gray. Concrete is gray. Oh, I forgot to press the rectangle button. So it says that there's concrete around the pool. <coughs> there's concrete around the pool, and it's uniform width. What does that mean, uniform width? It's the same everywhere, right? So then, right, this measurement right here that I'm indicating is the same as this measurement, is the same as this measurement, is the same as this measurement. So they're all the same. And this measurement, that's the measurement we're trying to determine. We're trying to figure out what it is. We're trying to figure out what it is. So we need to give it uh, a name. So what do you want to call it? X. Okay. <laughs> X. So that's X, and that's X, and that's X, and that's X. So the final piece of information that we know, the final piece of information that we know is that the area of the concrete is 400 square feet. I'm not really interested in that. 400. Okay. We need to we need to find the width So someone give me an idea. Okay, we need an equation. Okay, I agree. <coughs> but I, now, now I need help. <laughs> there's, there's lots of equations, right? So how shall we how shall we go about doing it? Okay, let's find yeah, let's find an area for the let's find an equation for the area of the concrete. Okay, <coughs> so then at least the way I see it, it should be the area of the of the big rectangle, right? And then what? Minus the area of the little rectangle, because what we want is we want this little strip, right? It looks like a picture frame. We just want that strip, not the area of the whole thing, but the area of just the the picture frame thing around it. Okay. So then, what is what is this measurement right here? Okay, think about it. What is this measurement? Right, it's 20, and then on the top there's an x, and on the bottom there's an x. So I'll say that it's 2x plus 20. 2x plus 20. Similarly, okay, similarly, <coughs> this measurement is what? 
2x plus 55. 2x plus 55. Okay, so then the area of the concrete, the area of the concrete uh, formula in terms of x, well, that should be 2x plus 20 multiplied by 2x plus 55. 2x plus 55. So then now let's multiply this all out. <coughs> So according to FOIL, this will be 4x squared okay, plus 110x plus 40x plus, oh, let's see, 1100, uh, zero, zero. is that right? <coughs> is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so then <coughs> this is 4x squared plus 150x plus 1100. Okay, so now the, the equation to solve is, is what? <coughs> so this right here, this thing that I'm boxing in green, this is the area, this is the area in terms of the concrete, in terms of Oh no, this isn't right. This isn't even close. What 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 is this? What is the thing that I that we just found? This is the area of the whole the whole box, right? So then this is this is the area of the big rectangle. So the area actually is 4x squared plus 150x plus 1100 minus the area of the inner rectangle, minus the area of the inner rectangle, which is 20 times 55. Five. <coughs> okay, which is 4x squared plus 150x plus one one zero zero minus one one zero zero. So this is four x squared plus one fifty x. Okay, good. So that's it. Okay, so that's the area of the concrete. Okay, so is there any question on how we came to the formula for the area of the concrete? Okay, so then now the equation that we need to solve is right, 4x squared plus 150x, right? That is, the, that is the area of the concrete, and we know that the area of the concrete is what? Is what? I wrote it at the top. Right, this, the area of the concrete is 400, right, it's 400. So this is what we need to solve. <coughs> so this is what we need to solve. Okay, so now, for just a minute, I want to try and, I want to do something that's wrong because I, sus in my experience, Many students do the following thing. So if you're going to write down what I'm going to write for the next few minutes, you need to write down that it's wrong. Okay? So then, <coughs> I from this point, if a student gets to this position, I expect to see a, a about 10% of the following kind of response. Student factors out x, 4x plus 150 is equal to 400. And then student says x is equal to 400 or 4x plus 150 is equal to 400. Okay, so then someone diagnose, help me diagnose what, what error the student has made. So the thing that has gone wrong, the thing that has gone wrong is this, is that if you had something like this, 
<coughs> say 3x squared minus 4x is equal to 0. If you had this, if you had this, if the right-hand side was 0, then you could factor the right-hand side and say, well, this is x multiplied by 3x minus 4 is equal to 0. And so now, now you have the product of two things on the left-hand side is equal to 0 on the right-hand side. So if you have two things and their product is 0, one of those things had to be 0. One of them had to be 0. Either the first one was 0 or the second one was 0. So this is x is 0 or 3x minus 4 is 0. So this right here on the right, that's legitimate. Okay, on the left, that's not legitimate. Right? You have the product of two things is equal to 400. So one of them had to be 400? No. No. Y one of them could have been 2 and the other one could have been 200. One of them could have been 4 and the other one could be 100. Right? There's, there's a multitude of things that could have happened. Neither one of them has to be 400. Okay, it's when, it's when one of the sides is zero that one of the terms must be zero. Okay, so I'm pointing this out because in my experience this is a very common error. Okay, so any question about why this is a common error? <coughs> okay, so if you, if you think back, right, you don't need to admit to anything, <laughs> but think back. If you've done this, then you need to stop. Okay. <coughs> so let's delete these things. Okay, so what should we do? All right, so I'll say, well, 4x squared plus 150x minus 400, right? That's generally the way to go, is you want to have a zero on one of the sides. So I move the 400 to the left-hand side. So here we have a quadratic. This is a quadratic because it's a degree to polynomial. If only, if only we had some kind of formula with which to solve quadratics. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> okay, good. <coughs> right, we have the quadratic formula. So let's write down. Let's write down the uh, the uh, a, b, and c. So what is a? A is four. B is one hundred and fifty, and c is negative 400. So let's write down the discriminant. Let's write down the discriminant. So the discriminant, what's the formula for the discriminant in terms of a, b, and c? Right, it's b squared minus 4ac. So we're going to write this down because we're going to check this first, right? We want to check this first because we want to see if there's a solution, right? Maybe there's not a solution. Okay, so then <coughs> according to this, it should be 150 squared minus 4 times 4 times negative 400. Okay. So 150 squared would be 225 with two zeros behind it. Okay, and then plus, right, because it's negative 4 times negative 400. 4 times 4 times 4 is 64, so this will be 64 with two zeros behind it. <coughs> okay, so then this is equal to, this is equal to, oh man, what is that? Uh, two, eight, nine, zero, zero. Okay, so two, eight, nine, zero, zero. That's the discriminant. So then what case are we in? The discriminant. The discriminant is positive. The discriminant is positive. So how many solutions are there to this equation? Two. Two. What are the other possibilities for the discriminant besides being positive? The discriminant could be negative. How many solutions are there when the discriminant is negative? There's one solution. Uh, no, zero. Right? You can't take, if it's negative, you can't take the square roots of negative numbers. Okay, then there's the other, the last possibility. Okay, what is the value of the discriminant when there's exactly one solution? Zero. Okay, good. So there's two solutions. Okay, so then let's figure out what they are. So x, x is equal to negative, I'll write it down, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac 
divided by 2a. For this particular problem, it is x is equal to negative 150 plus or minus the square root of 28900 over 2a. So a is 4, so 2a is 8. So now let's figure out what this is. <coughs> let's figure out what this is. So then what is the square root of 28900? Believe it or not, you should be able to figure this out without a calculator. What is it? Almost 17. 17 what? 17 with a 0 behind it. Right? Because what's 17 squared? 289. And what ha what squared is 100? 10. So the square root of 28900 is 17 times 10, which is 170. Okay, <coughs> so this is x is negative 150 plus or minus 170 divided by 8. And so now you need to write down both of the solutions. So one of the possibilities is that it's negative 150 minus 170 over 8. And the other possibility is that it could be that x is negative 150 plus 170 over 8. Okay, two possibilities. So li then let's figure out what they are <coughs> exactly. So negative 150 minus 170, that's negative 320 over 8. Or x is 20 over 8. So then let's write this down. x is negative 40. Or x is 2.5. Okay, and if this was a completely abstract problem, if this was a completely abstract problem, this is this would be where you stop. But this is a word problem, and this and we model the physical significance. Okay, there's there's physical properties to this problem, so one of these solutions does not belong. Which one does not belong? Negative 40 does not belong, I agree. Why not? I mean, what was x? What was x? <laughs> you know, what did it represent? What was it? Yeah, it, it represented a width. It represented a width. Could, could these widths be negative 40? No. <laughs> no, they couldn't be negative 40, right? So then... When I give you a problem, right, you need to you need to indicate to me that this is not a solution. Because x has to be positive. So then you need to write a conclusion. So the width of the concrete is x is equal to 2.5. Something like that. Okay, so any question about this example? <coughs> okay. So any questions before we move on to something that's different but not so different? Okay, so now briefly, we're going to be in section 2.4. Section 2.4, and these are going to be radical equations. Unfortunately, it's not quite as cool as it sounds. Okay, so radical equations. Uh, that is to say, e and the specific kind are equations that are reducible to quadratic form. So that is to say, we're going to deal with some equations 
that are actually quadratic equations that's just sort of hidden a little bit. Right? They, they are actually quadratic equations. Okay. <coughs> so, the, the thing that we're going to use repeatedly, okay, the thing that we're going to use repeatedly <coughs> is the following. If a is equal to b. Now, a and b could be numbers, they could be expressions, right? If some expression is equal to some other expression, then a to the n is b to the n. Okay, but you need to be a little bit careful, right? The, <laughs> the book is a little bit, <coughs> a little bit uh, uncareful about this. There's a direction of this. Right? If A is B, then A to the N is B to the N. That's a fact. Okay, so going, going top to bottom, that's a fact. What about bottom to top? If A to the N is B to the N, is it true that A is equal to B? Now, probably not, because I'm asking you a question, because right? <laughs> I brought this up. Okay, so then uh, here's an example. So this, right, what I'm telling you is that this is this direction is true, right? This direction is false, okay? And the book is a little bit uncareful about that. So, for example, for example, if you have, for a false one, if A is equal to negative 3 and B is equal to positive 3, are they the same value? No, these are two different values. However, A squared is equal to b squared. Okay. So then it's not true going in this direction. It's the same kind of thing like every square is a rectangle. That's a fact. Okay, now what is not a fact? Every rectangle is a square. That's not true. Right. Similarly, similarly, if it is nighttime, then I cannot see the sun. That's the definition, is that the Earth has rotated such that there is no line of sight to the sun. That's what nighttime is. If I cannot see the sun, is it nighttime? No. No, I can't see the sun right now. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. It's not nighttime. Right? So then you have to be careful with the direction of logical statements. Okay? So we're going to use this one. Okay? And I'm just telling you that can be a little bit slippery. Okay, so for example, for example, let's solve this. The square root of 3x minus 2 is equal to 5. <coughs> okay, so how can we go about solving this? What do you think? Right, we'll add 2 to both sides. So the square root of 3x is 7. Okay, now what? Square both sides. Okay, so if you square both sides, the square root of 3x squared is equal to 7 squared. So now, here's a little bit of a question I have for you. So. You know, I've harped on this pretty strongly. The, what is the square root of x squared? Absolute value of x. Okay, but now I have a question for you. Is what about what about this? The square root of x squared. Right, so this is you're doing things in the opposite order. In the red one, you're squaring x and then computing its square root. You're doing the squaring and then the square rooting. In the green one, you're doing square root and then squaring. So you're doing things in the opposite order. So what is it now? Just x. Just x. So why is it just x? So in fact, what it is, you could, it is x, but you could just as well say this. The square root of x squared is the absolute value of x. They're both the absolute value of x. 
They both are. Right? The green equation is true, and the blue equation is true. Someone explain to me why both of them are true. How can they both be true? How can they both be true? The reason is because you're computing a square root. You're computing a square root. And by writing that, that equation down, you are presupposing that it's possible to do that. That it's possible to do that. So if it is possible to compute the square root of x, then x can't possibly be can't be negative. Right? X can't be negative. X can't be negative. So if x can't be negative, then the absolute value of x is x. So these these two equations are the same equation. Okay. <coughs> So you just need to be careful with this kind of thing. So then, that being said, uh, I need to continue here. What is the square root of 3x all squared? 3x is equal to 49. Okay, <coughs> so any question about how that happened? Okay, so then what is x? 49 over 3. Fantastic. So any question about the opening example? Good. <coughs> Let's continue. Okay. So, for example, how about x to the negative 5 halves is equal to 32? I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So you're saying you're saying to write. Uh, th I think this is what you're saying is that you could say one over one over x to the five halves is equal to 32, and then you could rewrite the denominator as the square root of x to the fifth. I guess something like that is what you're saying. Okay. So then, yeah, that's a good way. You can think of it like that. So then, at least me, I was thinking of it a slightly different way. Okay, I was thinking of it like the following. <coughs> you could say that x to the negative 5 halves, right, just rewriting the same equation. Okay, so then I want, in a sense, I want to solve for x. So I want the exponent for x to be, uh, to be what? I want the exponent for x to be 1, right? I want x to the 1. I don't want x to the negative 5 halves. Okay, so then I want to raise both sides to some exponent. What exponent? Almost 2 fifths. Negative 2 fifths, right? Negative 2 fifths. Okay, so then if you do that, right, x to the negative 5 halves, uh, 5 halves, raised to the negative fifths. Well, that should be 32 raised to the negative 2 fifths. So then the reason why you want to do that is because now, now on the left-hand side, right, I have iterated exponents. I have iterated exponents. And what do you do with exponents when they're iterated? Okay, how do you combine them? You multiply them. So then what is negative 5 halves multiplied by negative 2 fifths? It's 1, right? That's the point. That's the point, is that this is x to the 1 is equal to 32 to the negative 2 fifths. Okay, so then just x is equal to 32 to the negative 2 fifths. Okay, but now you need to, you know, I'll write the instructions very, very clearly that you have to evaluate this completely, blah, blah, blah. So we need to figure out, well, what is 32 to the negative 2 fifths? And you're not going to have a calculator, so how is it that you go about doing that? 
So what was the idea? Okay, so at least the first thing that I would do, because it's the way I think, is I would say that this is 32 to the 2 fifths. Okay, to get it 1 over 32 to the 2 fifths so that I have a positive exponent. So that I have a positive exponent. Okay, then I see that, oh, I need to compute the 2 fifths power of 32. Okay, so then 1 over, and you can, you can factor that exponent as follows. It will be, uh, what, 32 to the 1 fifth to the 2. 32 to the 1 fifth to the 2. Okay, and right, 32 is one of those numbers in that table that I said you need to memorize. Right? You should know what the 1 fifth power of 32 is. What is it? 2. Right? Because you've got 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Right? 2 to the 5th is 32, so the 5th root of 32 is 2. <coughs> so then this is this is x is equal to 1 over 2 to the 2 and then 2 to the 2 is 4 shouldn't be much argument there so x is a fourth so any question about this example okay so the purpose of this was just to get you sort of accustomed to dealing with these exponents what other way? <coughs> this one? Like so? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, c you could continue. So what I, would do <laughs> what I would do from here is essentially turn this into, you know, I would, if I was doing this, solving this problem, I would start from here and go this direction and then go back this direction. That's what I would do. <coughs> but everyone does these things a little bit differently. Okay, <coughs> so now let's have an example that is a little bit different. So how about, how about this equation? x to the fourth plus x squared minus six is equal to zero. Hmm, so let's think about this for a minute. <coughs> now. I have a question for you. My question for you is, is this a quadratic in the variable x? So is it a quadratic in x? No, I agree. Why not? What is a quadratic? What is a quadratic? It's a polynomial of degree 2. What is the degree of this polynomial? 4. So emphatically, no. 4 is not equal to 2. Uh, so this is not a quadratic. However, however, note the following, and that is that, well, for some reason that's not clear yet, for some reason that's not clear yet, I'm going to rewrite x to the fourth like this. I'm going to say that, well, this is x squared squared. That's true. That's what x to the fourth is, x squared squared, plus x squared minus 6 is equal to 0. So that's perfectly legitimate. So now I'm going to say I'm going to write I'm going to write that u is equal to x squared. Okay, just to change the names up a little bit. And change the names up a little bit. And then now it becomes u squared plus u minus 6 is equal to 0. Now, is this a quadratic? Yes, this is a quadratic, but now we need to be more specific. It is a quadratic in what symbol? 
in the symbol u, right? It's not a quadratic in the symbol x. But it is a quadratic in the symbol u. So this is a quadratic in u. So now, this, is the this kind of equation is the prototype of, the, of this section, right? I gave you an equation. Was it, a, was it a quadratic? No, it wasn't a quadratic. It wasn't a quadratic. However, because I made an observation that I could write u as x squared and then rewrite the equation in terms of u, that's a quadratic. Okay, so we reduce, right? We reduce the given equation to a quadratic equation. So that's why this section is called equations reducible to quadratics. So then now, here is a quadratic in u. And now we have all these tools available to us to solve quadratic equations. So you could solve this using the quadratic formula. I don't recommend it. Okay, you should always do whatever is easiest, right? So you should know what is the easiest way to solve this particular quadratic equation by doing something that starts with f. Factoring, right? You can factor this one. Have a look at it. Can you see that it factors? Right? It can be written as u something, u something equal to 0. So what needs to go in the positions here? Right, plus 3, minus 2. Okay, plus 3 and minus 2. The reason why is because we need, we need two numbers whose product is negative 6. So you might think, well, it could be negative 3 and positive 2, or it could be positive 3 and negative 2. Okay, you just go through the possibilities and check, and here's the right one. Okay, so now, now we have the product of two things is 0. The product of two things is 0. So one of them, one of them has to be 0. Right, so either u plus 3 is 0, or u minus 2 is 0. Okay, so I'll solve these, right? This is u is negative 3, or u is 2. So is this the, s the solution to the problem? Probably not. Every time I ask that question, the answer is no. Okay, so why is this not the, why is this not the solution to the problem? Right, because, th because I gave you the equation in terms of symbol x, right? Currently, we have solutions in terms of symbol u. Okay, so then this, this corresponds to, so now we're going to now re-substitute u is x squared. So there are now two possibilities. x squared is equal to negative 3 or x squared is equal to 2. So now we need to solve for x. <coughs> so tell me about the solutions to the first equation. <coughs> there aren't any, right? And that's a perfectly legitimate situation. There are no solutions. <coughs> How about the solutions to the second equation? x squared is 2. How many solutions are there? Not one. Two. There's two solutions. What are they? Right, so then, so then I'll go through this again. <laughs> so then, generally speaking, right, the solution to x squared is equal to d for any d, right? Or we said a, right? I think when I wrote it down, so I'll use a again. That is, x is negative the square root of a, or x is positive the square root of a. Okay, so then there are two solutions. x is negative square root of 2, or x is positive the square root of 2. Okay, so now I'd like to, you know, to point something out. That's interesting, right? So we re-substitute, we substituted, you know, 
I gave you an equation, wasn't a quadratic, but then you made some kind of nice, cute observation and then turned it into a quadratic. And then we used all the things that we knew before and we solved it as if it was a quadratic and then at the end we resubstituted that u is x squared and blah, 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 blah. So notice, right, this problem, this problem was such that you got two solutions, u is negative three and u is two. Now u is negative three, that resulted that branch of the problem gave no solution, and that's a perfectly legitimate thing to happen. But I, I could just change, I could change this problem just slightly, just slightly. I could, I could make it to where uh, it would be x to the fourth plus 5x squared plus 6. Okay, no, the other way. X, x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 6. Okay, if I did that, then you would get the solution u is 3 and u is 2, right? You get u is 3 or u is 2. Then how many solutions would there be to this question? There'd be four solutions, right? Because I could make it to where, you know, in the bottom left, we got x squared is negative 3, and that resulted in no solution for x. But what I'm saying is I could have made it in the bottom left. I could have, I could have made it x squared is 3, or x squared is 2. And then how many solutions would there be? There would be 4. So now I have a question for you. <coughs> you know, a linear equation in x, well, that, that's a polynomial of degree 1. Okay. And how many solutions does that have? 1. It can have 1 solution. The, ma the, the maximum finite number of solutions is 1. How about a polynomial of degree 2? That's called a quadratic. What is the maximum number of solutions to a quadratic equation? Two. Okay, so degree one solu equations have one solution. Degree two equations have at most two solutions. Right? We didn't do three, but here we just did four. And I just described a situation where a degree four equation has four solutions. Okay, so what do you think is going to be the general pattern? A degree a degree 10 equation can have at most 10 solutions, etc. Right? So a degree n equation can have at most n solutions. So this is a, that's a fairly significant uh, thing that math, math majors end up proving. That's called the fundamental theorem of algebra. Right? That an equation of degree n, well, what the fundamental theorem of algebra says that an equation of degree n has a solution. And as a consequence, you, it is a, degree, a, de, in a, uh, a polynomial of degree n has exactly n solutions. <coughs> Fantastic. So any question about this? Any question about it? Okay, good. How are we doing on time? Lots of time. So let's finish this section, and then we can have a short break. Mm, we need an interesting one. <coughs> An interesting one. Okay. So here we go. <coughs> Four X to the two thirds. Four X to the two thirds minus nine x to the one third plus two is equal to zero. Okay, <coughs> so then the instruction is reduce this to a quadratic and solve. <coughs>
So what do you think? I need to make a substitution. So like in the last example I did, I said u is x squared. What do you think we should say in this one? u is u. Hmm. Let's think about it for a minute. Okay, so then notice that this first term, 4x to the 2 thirds, can be written like 4x to the 1 third, and then what? Squared. And then minus 9x to the 1 third plus 2 is 0. So what do you think the substitution we need to make is? u is x to the 1 third. <coughs> u is x to the 1 third. Okay, so then now we have 4 u squared minus 9 u plus 2 is 0. So the equation I gave you was in terms of x, and it was not a quadratic. It was not a quadratic because it was not a polynomial of degree 2. However, with this sort of convenient observation, we have turned it into a polynomial in u of degree 2. So this is a quadratic in u. This is a quadratic in u. So then, now what? Now what? <coughs> now we need to factor it. Right, but this, right, this is sort of not convenient, right? <laughs> not convenient, right? How shall we factor it? Should it be, you know, you might wonder, is it, should it be 4u and u, or should it be, you know, on the, on the alternative it could be 2u and what else? Another 2u, like so. So, so do you want to try and factor it like this with guess and check, or do you want to use the quadratic formula? Which one do you want to use? I don't care which one. It doesn't matter to me. Sorry? Okay, he likes guess and check. Fine, we'll do guess and check. So then let's try it out. <coughs> okay, so we do, you know, we'll try that one, we'll try that one. Let's try out some possibilities. So what do you want to try in here? We need two things to go in these positions, right? One with the 4u and one with the u. We need their products to be 2. Negative 1 and what? Negative 2? Okay, so then the product of those two things is is positive 2. Great. So I don't know if this is correct or not. How do we verify that this is correct? We multiply it out. Okay. <coughs> so let's check. Okay, so then you would get 4u squared minus 8u minus u plus 2. So is that right? Oh, so we got lucky. So, or, or someone's better than I am, right? So we got it on the first. We got it on the first try. Okay, fine. <coughs> That's fine. So then, any question about about doing this? Okay. So now there are two possibilities. What? We have the product of things is zero. Product of things is zero. So either four u minus one is zero, or u minus two is zero. So either 4u is equal to 1 or u uh, is equal to 2. Right, so then the two possibilities are u is 1 fourth or u is 2. So is this the solution to the problem? No, right? We, we need the solution to be in terms of Okay, so then, so x 
to the one third, right? That's what u was, is one fourth. Or x to the one third is two. Okay, so now there's these possibilities. So now how do we proceed? Now what? How do we solve for x? So what we're going to do is we're going to use this thing that we said at the beginning. If a is equal to b, that means that a to the n is b to the n. Okay, so then now we have, for example, on the second equation, it's slightly easier to deal with because it doesn't have a fraction uh, on the right-hand side. x to the one-third is 2. So I want to have exponent 1 for x. I want x to the 1. So what exponent do I raise both sides to? 3, right? x to the one-third cubed is 2 cubed. Right, so what is x to the one-third cubed? It's x. So x is 2 cubed, and 2 cubed is 8. Okay. So then similarly, the same thing on the left equation, x to the one-third cubed is one-fourth cubed. And one-fourth cubed is how much? Yes, one-sixty-fourth. Fantastic. Okay, now, uh, are these both solutions to the problem? One-sixty-fourth and eight. Okay, if they are not, tell me why not. If they are, tell me why. <coughs> right, because on you know some of the some of the time we have to discard solutions, like when we were doing the block or the pool thingy, we have to say, oh no, no, that one not a solution. They are all of these solutions. All of them solutions. So what is it? So. Remind me, what does it mean, you know, if, you, if you've come down to the end of a problem like this, you come to the end, you've got a list of 13 different numbers, okay, some of them solutions, some of them not. What does it mean for a number to be a solution? What does that mean? You can plug it into the equation and you get a true equation. So the question is, is can you plug those two values into the original equation? Okay, yes. Why can you? Because they both work. Okay, so then give me an example where they uh, might not work. Okay, so then we got to make sure that this point is clear because in, in my experience, <coughs> many students, they just arrive at the end and then they're just, okay, I'm at the end now. <laughs> Why is this end a valid end? So let's check. Let's check and make sure that this is true then because you need to have confidence in where you are. Okay, so let's check. How do we check? by plugging in. Okay, so then we'll check uh, 8, since that one's easier to check first. So 4 multiplied by 8 to the 2 thirds minus 9 multiplied by 8 to the 1 third plus 2 is equal to 0. Let's check. So 8 to the 2 thirds, right, that will be 4 multiplied by 8 to the 1 third squared, right, because that's how you factor the exponent two-thirds, minus nine. Now, eight to the one-third, that's a quantity you should know. What is it? Two plus two. Okay. So this is four multiplied by two squared, and then this is minus 18 plus two is zero. OK, 
Okay, so 2 squared is 4, multiplied by 4 is 16, so 16 minus 18 plus 2 is equal to 0. So is it true? Yeah, that's true. Okay, let's make sure we can do the arithmetic for the other solution. Okay, so then <coughs> 4 and then 1 64th to the 1 3rd squared, right, that's 2 thirds, uh, minus 9 1 64th to the 1 3rd. Plus 2 is 0. Okay, so then I'll worry about the first term in a second. Minus 9. And then what is 1 64th to the 1 third? 1 over 4, right? So the reason why you should know that is that you should know 64, right? 64 can be written in so many convenient ways, right? It can be 2 to the 6. It can be 4 to the 3 all these kinds of things. So if 64 is 4 to the 3, then 64 to the 1 over 3 is 4. So 1 over 64 to the 1 over 3 is 1 over 4. Plus 2 is 0. So this is 4, 1 fourth squared. <coughs> OK, so this is right 4 times 1 fourth. So I'll write it like this. 4 over 16 minus 9 over 4 plus 2 is 0. So 4 over 16 is the same as 1 over 4 minus 9 over 4. And then I'll make 2 into 4 also. So how much, how many fourths is 2? 8 of them, right? 8 fourths. Uh, eight So 1 fourth plus 8 fourths is 9 fourths, minus 9 fourths is 0. So they're both solutions. So you should feel very comfortable with all of this arithmetic and with showing these kinds of steps. Okay, so any questions? Okay, so I have 1044. We'll continue at 1050. <coughs>